Hello, welcome to the program. This is the Black Ponder. I am Neil Trotter. And in this video, we're going to be talking about philosophy of history. It's a branch within the field of philosophy. And we're going to do that through a Islamic lens, okay? Islamic perspective. Because we're talking about this work right here. Okay, we're having a discourse on this book. It's called Makodehim, uh, and it is by a uh, prominent Islamic philosopher, Ibn Khaldun. And let me, if it'll focus, you can see some information about the translation by Franz Rosenthal. We got an edited and abridged by N.J. Uh, Daywood, and then with the introduction by Bruce B. Lawrence. And this is a Princeton edition, if it'll focus. Uh, it looks like that's not happening, but that's okay, <laughs> because uh, just take my word for it, it's Princeton edition. So a lot of times when you, or when, at least when I'm reading texts that have to do with the philosophy of history, the introduction of the book is where you get the most information. You know, the beginning part where the author is, or the philosopher is mostly talking about what is philosophy of history and what is its goal. Um, that's where you get a lot of the, the, the golden nuggets. Afterwards, when the author starts talking about the actual history of civilization, uh, oftentimes you get, you get mistakes, um, incorrect assumptions, uh, just, just wrong facts. <laughs> you see that a lot in these philosophy of history texts. And it's true with this book too. Let's not get it twisted. It's interesting as a historic record, the later half of the book, where you can see like, okay, this is what some people thought of the world. And this book was originally published sometime in the later half of the 14th century. So, you know, that's a long time ago. Uh, the understanding of the world was limited. So it's typical to see those kinds of shortcomings. So for the most part, what I want to focus on is this philosopher's take on what is philosophy of history? You know, what is history? What is the meaning of history? Okay, that's an interesting question. And it's something that we need to think about. So let's begin with reading a, some quotes from the book. And then I'll add supplementary commentary. This is how we do things at the Black Ponder. And we'll go about examining that question. What is the meaning of history? So I'll start on page five of this book. This is actually the forward of the text. And I'm going to begin on the third paragraph. The inner meaning of history, on the other hand, involves speculation and an attempt to get at the truth. Subtle explanation of the causes of origins of existing things and deep knowledge of the how and why of events. History, therefore, is firmly rooted in philosophy. It deserves to be accounted a branch of it. So Ibn Khaldun is making a case for why we should even have a philosophical examination of history. Why? Okay, well, I'll continue. I'm going to skip a paragraph. This is the fifth one. Little effort is being made to get at the truth. The critical eye, as a rule, is not sharp. Errors and unfounded assumptions are closely allied and familiar elements in historical information. Blind trust in tradition is an inherent trait in human beings. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's true today? I think so. <laughs> but I'll continue. Let me skip four lines down. The evil of falsehood is to be fought with enlightened speculation. The reporter merely dictates and passes on the material. It takes critical insight to sort out the hidden truth. It takes knowledge to lay truth bare and polish it so that critical insight may be applied. So let me highlight what's being said here. Enlightened speculation. Enlightened speculation. That's required to go toward truth. I continue on page six. This is the third line of the second paragraph. Works have been distinguished by universal acceptance of the information they contain and by adaption of their methods in their presentation of material. The discerning critic is his own judge as to which part of their material he finds spurious, and which he gives credence to. Civilization, in its different conditions, 
contains different elements to which historical information may be related and with which reports and historical material may be checked. So we're talking about vetting information. Uh, considering which information is important and which information is valuable and which information should we give credence to. How is that process worked out? Let me skip to page seven. This is the end of the, the first line. They, they being historians, presented historical information about dynasties and stories of events from the earliest times as mere forms without substance. Historians presented information as mere forms without substance. Let me skip down two lines. It concerns happenings, the origins of which are not known. Mm, that's, let me repeat that. It concerns happenings, the origins of which are not known. Okay, this is how we're receiving information. This is important because this is actually how information is distilled today, isn't it? We well, think about it. But let me skip down a line. They neglected the importance of change over the generations in their treatment of historical material because they had no one who could interpret it for them. I underlined that. Uh, because they had no one who could interpret it for them. Okay? And we're talking about context, historical context. That needs an interpretation. Okay? It's interesting. Well, I'll continue. Their works, therefore, give no explanation for it. When they then turn to the descriptions of a particular dynasty, they report the historical information parrot-like and take care to preserve it as it had been passed down to them, whether imaginary or true. They do not turn to the beginning of the dynasty, nor do they tell why it unfurled its banner and was able to give prominence to its emblem or what caused it to come to a stop when it had reached its term. So the author here is talking about historical information and not just receiving it at face value, but understanding where the information originated from and to understand that origin, to understand its context. You see that a lot today, right? You see a, a lot of information is given, particularly on the internet, uh, but there's not a lot of context supply. So we're rece receiving this information at face value, which doesn't reveal its actual truth. And I wrote in my notes here, you know, in the margins, uh, you know, it's not all just parrot-like. You know, some people are just reciting information like parrots, right? But there's other people who have an, an agenda to serve, and they're presenting the information, the historical information to serve that agenda, rather than actually getting at the truth of the history. Or in other words, they are not examining the context, the, the historical context of where this information is coming from. They're just using it to propagate their own personal stance. So let's dive deeper into this, this uh, idea, this concept of the importance of ex examining historical context or you know, the, this idea of enlightened speculation to getting at truth when we're talking about history. I'm going to go on page 11, and this is the third paragraph. The writing of history requires numerous sources and much varied knowledge. It also requires a good speculative mind and thoroughness, which lead the historian to the truth and keep him from slips and errors. If he trusts historical information in its plain transmitted form and has no clear knowledge of the principles resulting from custom, the fundamental facts of politics, the nature of civilization, or the conditions governing human social organization, and if, furthermore, he does not evaluate remote or ancient material through comparison with near or contemporary material, he often cannot avoid stumbling and slipping and deviating from the path of truth. And I'll stop right there. Because he, that's a very powerful uh, set of words right there. <laughs> uh, because we're doing this today, are we not? Uh, we're taking historical information or, you know, information about things that happened in the past, the news, 
For instance, we're taking uh, information at face, face value. Oftentimes, uh, a speculative discussion of, okay, is this information actually true? Where is this information coming from? Who is telling this information? And why are they telling this information? Using your brain and understanding the fundamental facts of politics, being political, understanding like actual politics, okay? The nature of civilization, like, well, how does civilization actually work? Sociology, right? Understanding like sociology, the conditions of governing human social organizations, okay? Government, <laughs> okay? Or, you know, you, you gotta think about these things and evaluate remote or ancient materials. Understanding texts from the past, right? Or things that happened very far in the, in the past and how they relate to today. What influences do those things that have happened in the past uh, affect the world we live in today? Which is a thing that happens, right? All these things need to be taken into consideration when we're thinking about information from the past to get toward like the truth of that information. But I'll continue right where I left off. Historians, Quran commentators, and leading transmitters have committed frequent errors in the stories and events they reported. They accepted them in the plain transmitted form without regard for its value. They did not check them with the principles underlying such historical situations, nor did they compare them with similar material. Also, they did not probe with the yardstick of philosophy, with the help of knowledge of the nature of things, or with the help of speculation and historical insight. Therefore, they strayed from the truth and found themselves lost in the desert of baseless assumptions and errors. Basically, the point is, we gotta start thinking about history from a philosophical perspective to actually get toward the truth of history, or the truth of past occurrences. Let me give you an example. You know, let's use the news. <laughs> now, the news doesn't talk about like old history, but it does talk about past occurrences, things that have happened and how do they relate to today. You know, maybe they happened yesterday or, you know, breaking news is things that are happening currently, but, you know, they are referring to things that, that have happened and how they are affecting uh, what's happening today. So think of news as like, short-term history or the latest history so you know you think about the news that you receive and where do you receive it from and the perspective that you get you know you have networks news networks that give you the same story like you take the same story right and you see it on the channel like fox news or you see it on cnn or you see it on npr or you see it on pbs or you see it on facebook you're going to get very different perspectives of that same occurrence in the same event. Why? You know, those organizations are, they're not just giving you the facts parrot-like, right? They're not, you know, they're, they're giving you different perspectives and it's just going to vary vastly, right? And so you got to ask yourself why. Why is that the case? And so uh, the parrot-like situation comes with the receiver you know and uh, the person that's watching Fox News will see it in, and they're just taking it in <laughs> and they're like oh I guess that's just how it is you know somebody who's just watching Fox News and that's it not thinking about okay what is the context of this information where is this information coming from who is telling it why they're going to accept the perception that Fox News has given them, or CNN, or PBS, or NPR, or all these other uh, points of views. It could be YouTube, right? YouTube has several uh, large news channels with their own perspective as well. So oftentimes, information about the same occurrence, the same historical event, is being talked about in different ways. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that the case? Why aren't all these different groups giving me the exact same information? <laughs> right. Or like telling it to me in the exact same way. Why? Why is it different? Mm -hmm. And you can even go further. You know, when we talk about news on Facebook, uh, that's just coming from like your friends. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, you talk to each friend and your friend has a, a very specific kind of way of telling the news of that's happened. 
what is it about your friend that's giving you that specific kind of perspective or viewpoint on that event as opposed to somebody else? These are important things to think about when we receive information about past events. It's very important to consider the historical context of information that you may be receiving uh, if you're interested in getting at the actual truth. Let me read you this other quote. It is on page 26. It's the seventh line. Often, someone who has learned a good deal of past history remains unaware of the changes that conditions have undergone. Without a moment's hesitation, he applies his knowledge of the present to historical information and measures such information by the things he has observed with his own eyes. Although the difference between the two is great, Consequently, he falls into an abyss of error. The person falls into a, an abyss of error. You know, this actually happens. Why? Because people, let's say people on Facebook or, um, you know, an individual, right? Because nowadays, in the, today's uh, internet world, uh, news is being distilled by individuals, not even just like large conglomerate networks like CNN or Fox News. Yeah, they're doing it too. And this applies to them too. But now we're seeing like individuals giving you news reports and like information about past historical events. But oftentimes what happens is that uh, the person doing that is applying their own knowledge of the present, like their own personal knowledge of the present, their own personal experience and what they've been through. And they apply that to the historical event that happened. You know, you'll get the situation where somebody's telling you, okay, this, this thing that just happened in the news recently happened because of this, that, and the other thing. Because you see, what happened to me is this, this, and this, and this. And I live in a world where this, this, and this, and this. And when I, I meet people, this, this, and this has happened. So therefore, that historical event or that news uh, occurrence that happened is this, this, and this, this because of what I went through. <laughs> but it's important to understand that a lot of what's happening in the world or things that happen historically uh, are outside your personal experience, <laughs> right? It's very difficult for us to separate our personal experience from experiences of other people, right? We always got to kind of infer our experience onto um, other situations. And that's not to like belittle our own personal experiences. Um, and sometimes, oftentimes we do need to consider what's going on with ourselves. But a lot of times we need to consider what's going on within ourselves because our experiences oftentimes put the blinders on our, on our points of view. Right? And when we look at other things that are happening in the world, our present day reality is blocking the truth of what's actually going on in the world. You see what I mean? There's a lot of uh, personal inferring going on to current events or historical events. And that's uh, leading people to abysses of error. I'll repeat what he said. Uh, there's a lot of application of the person of our own knowledge of the present to historical information and measures such information measures historical events by the things we have observed with our own eyes <laughs> even though what we have observed with our own eyes is very different from what actually happened in the his historical past or even like events that have happened today that are outside our experience. Okay, we gotta, don't fall into this trap of inferring our personal experiences directly onto current affairs or historical information. We gotta remember that there is a, a difference between the two that is great. But that's not to say that our personal experiences are separate or don't influence the experiences of others okay they can do it directly and they can do it indirectly but you got to understand that there is a difference although there there at the same time there is a relation there's a diversity of experience 
but the diversity of experience is interconnected. Okay, there's an ecology going on that you can see in history, an in interdependence of human societies everywhere. Let me read you uh, this other quote, set of quotes I picked. This is, this is page 45, and I'll start right at the beginning. Human social organization is something necessary. The philosophers express this fact by saying man is political by nature. That is, he cannot do without the social organization for which the philosophers use the technical term town, polis. This is what civilization means, the necessary character of human social organization or civilization. Ibn Khaldun is saying that civilization is necessary okay, to human existence. We must form societies to function as human beings. Uh, let me skip down to the third paragraph. The power of the individual human being is not sufficient for him to obtain the food he needs and does not provide him with as much food as he requires to live. Even if we assume an absolute minimum of food, that is, food enough for one day, a little wheat, for instance, the amount of food could be obtained only after much preparation, such as grinding, kneading, and baking. Each of these three operations requires utensils and tools that can be provided only with the help of several crafts, such as the crafts of the blacksmith, the carpenter, and the potter. Assuming that a man could eat unprepared grain, an even greater number of operations would be necessary in order to obtain the grain, sowing and reaping, and threshing to separate it from the husks of the ear. Each of these operations requires a number of tools and many more crafts than those just mentioned. It is beyond the power of one man alone to do all that, or part of it, by himself. Thus, he cannot do without a combination of many powers from among his fellow beings. If he is to obtain food for himself and for them, through cooperation, the needs of a number of persons, many times greater than their own number, can be satisfied. So what the author is saying here is that people can't live on their own. <laughs> they just can't. We don't... The world we live in is a world where a person cannot survive by themselves. Right? They need other people to survive. Even like those, you know, you'll see those survival TV shows or reality shows on like, you know, I don't know, Discovery Channel or the Learning Channel or one of those um, educational channels, Animal Planet. You'll see a guy like, okay, I'm going to go out into the wilderness and I'm going to try to survive for seven days or like... You know, they put me out in the middle of nowhere and I'm going to go find, go back to civilization and by myself, right? You're still seeing a guy with all types of equipment, right? And tools that were manufactured or made. And eventually the person does return back to civilization, <laughs> right? Even people that go off the grid, for instance, they still live in communities. Or maybe they'll go to trips where they, they'll buy resources from like the local shop that's like a mom and pop shop or whatever. But they'll still be getting supplies from somebody else. All this is to say that we live in an ecological world, right, where we're all independent on each other. And to say that somebody can succeed independently is false. And that needs to be taken into consideration when we think about history and the progress of civilization and human societies. That's important to understand because not only are humans inherently social creatures, uh, we need to develop civilizations <laughs> to progress, to uh, actualize our true beings. But take a look at this quote. You know, we're talking about society and the necessity for society for human beings. Uh, but I'm going to go here on page 95, and I'm going to start at the seventh to the last line of the second paragraph. Man is a child of the customs and the things he has become used to. He is not the product of his natural disposition and temperament. The conditions to which he has become accustomed 
until they have become for him a quality of character and matters of habit and custom have replaced his natural disposition. If one studies this in human beings, one will find much of it, and it will be found to be a correct observation. Mm -hmm. So, here, the author is, is talking about, look, social conditioning is a thing, and people are heavily influenced by social conditioning. They are more influenced by social conditioning than they are their inherent nature. <laughs> and that's definitely true. That's definitely true. Uh, and that's an important consideration when thinking back to how we interpret historical information. Right? Uh, oftentimes we interpret historical information based off of our social conditioning, our own personal experiences. And I'll go so far as to say that we do that with the news too, <laughs> or information of any past event. And it's important not to fall into that trap, you know, to realize I am a victim of social conditioning because I'm a human being and human beings are dependent on societies to live. <laughs> and you know, that's good. Societies are good to, to have, but there's negatives to societies too, because societies can be trapped into their own personal experiences and then they disregard the experiences of others or like they don't even realize other societies are having these other experiences so other experiences get discounted so Ibn Khaldun is just saying like be aware of that <laughs> be aware of that and understand that that does lead to errors in terms of interpreting historical information and getting toward truth so the author here is really dropping some dimes of information and some vi very valuable nuggets of wisdom. But like I said before, a lot of the book isn't dimes of wisdom. A lot of the book is incorrect information too. Let me read you this example. Mm -hmm. Let me read you this example. This is uh, page 117 and this is the last paragraph. And he says, look, therefore, the Negro nations are, as a rule, submissive to slavery because Negroes have little that is essentially human and possess attributes that are quite similar to those of dumb animals, as we have stated. You know, and the book is, you know, there's a lot of that in the book, <laughs> you know, that kind of racist type of language and also, you know, a lot of incorrect geographical information. This is like the 15th century. Um, this society hasn't like traveled the world yet, doesn't understand the full you know, mapping of the world. So there you hear a lot. So you encounter a lot of false geographical information as well. So just be aware and be speculative <laughs> like all works. I mean, you know, as I said, a lot of these old school texts on the philosophy of history uh, make those kinds of errors <laughs> and be aware of that. It is kind of interesting just to get um, a take on what these, this specific perspective thought about the world. Now, you know, this doesn't represent all Islamic point of view, right? This is a specific, like, academic, old 14th century uh, socioeconomic class that was probably, you know, well-to-do rich. But it's interesting to get a point of view from that perspective and, you know, be speculative, have it enlightened speculation about the history that's put down here in books like these and you know take the advice of uh, Ibn Khaldun even though he doesn't oftentimes take his own advice <laughs> which is fine you know everybody makes mistakes but what he is saying about the philosophy of history and the, the meaning of history and how people interpret information that's as true as it was then as it is now it's important in this day and age where we're just receiving information up the wazoo that we are very speculative about what we're taking in and you know very cognizant about the, the context of what we're taking in and also like be aware of your how you are inferring your own personal experience to that past occurrence, you know, or to that information that you receive, ask yourself, how much am I considering what I know today 
getting in the way of what's actually being said here. For example, when discussions here about the structure of the world, right? Well, obviously they didn't travel the world. You know, they didn't have satellites and they, you know, the circumnavigation wasn't happening or, you know, it just happened in other parts of the world or other civilizations were doing it, like the Polynesians, for instance. They might have had a better understanding of the map of the world, but this particular Islamic society did not. Be speculative. Use enlightened speculation about the information that you receive. Take into consideration the historical context and don't let your knowledge of the present day cloud your judgment of past events. And don't let your personal experiences encompass your entire understanding of situations that are happening in the news. Understand that things that are happening might be outside your personal experience or they might be things that you are unaware of that your personal experience has not given you enough information about. And consider the inf experiences of others who might be more knowledgeable about what's going on. Not necessarily because they might be more smarter or more intelligent, it's just because they've been through it and maybe you haven't. <laughs> I do encourage you to check out this book, the uh, uh, Himma. <laughs> check it out, you know, trying to word it properly. It's a great uh, take on the history of philosophy, even though there's a lot of errors about the actual history. <laughs> the philosophy is pretty uh, powerful, and there are lessons that are applicable to today. Well, you've been watching The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thoughts.